Gecko Linux, a Linux distribution for detail-oriented geckos. Gex is a gecko from a series of video games popular mostly in the late 90s. I remember playing Gex on a demo disc that I got for my PS1 and I thought climbing on the walls was a cool thing for the time. The controls always felt a little bit wonky though, they were really stiff and the animations just weren't great and they kind of made it feel even more stiff. When you take damage, the whole game freezes as if it locked up or something. Gex 3 is totally different, it's a 3D game and it seems that you roam a level rather than progressing on some linear path like in regular Gex. This is just the demo here, but I guess I'm supposed to be solving a crime or a puzzle or something? If you tail whip a TV, a green bug comes out and hovers around you. I couldn't help but think of Spyro when I saw this. Do you know what the dragonfly following you is doing? In Spyro, the little dragonfly shows the amount of health you have but also helps collect gems. Sparks is awesome. But yeah, Gecko Linux is a Linux spin based on the OpenSUSE Linux distribution with a focus on polish and out-of-the-box usability for desktop. It comes in a bunch of different flavors, but the one that was specifically requested for me to look at was Gecko Linux Rolling with the LX Cute desktop. So let's check it out. It has a live session like most distributions anymore, and the live session has a desktop shortcut that just says Install Languages. And if you run it, it wants to update the whole ass system, which probably isn't the best idea in a live session. The installer is the venerable Calamares, and there's an option in here that lets you swap or swap to a file. So like swap suspend, swap hibernate, or just swap to a file. The wording kind of makes me think that ZRAM is enabled, so we'll see if it is later on. Calamares lets you install without a bootloader, and the overall install process was really quick, especially for an OpenSUSE distro. Not that there's a whole bunch of distros based on OpenSUSE, but OpenSUSE usually takes a while to install. Now I'm not sure what the session manager is here, but there's an option to boot straight into OpenBox instead of the regular LXQt session. We'll check that out later. And on the desktop, we see that language installer again. Oh boy. So we've got a desktop icon that asks for root without any explanation. It does a zipper dup, which bricks the system if you allow it to happen. And it does an automated install of language packages and whatever else the author wants to put in there. And for me, it completely checked out to lunch while installing Mozilla translations and it never recovered. Control C caused it to crash, so yeah. Now the reason why I implied that a zipper upgrade is bad is because it kind of screws the whole system up. In fact, I'll show you just what happens at the end of this video. The default desktop layout is Windows XP-like. So we've got like a start menu launcher on the bottom left and a date time applet on the bottom right. It also has its very own power applet manager which shows a pretty good amount of information. And it's asynchronous, so if you unplug or plug in while you have it open, it auto-updates. That's cool. It looks like Network Manager is the standard, uh, well, Network Manager. The Audio Mixer is just a slider with pretty bad styling. The actual configuration is done via Pulse Audio directly, which is a pain because it's not easy to choose the default input or output. So it obviously has desktop icons by default. I noticed that Pluma is the default text editor of choice. When you're looking to open a file in Pluma or any sort of GTK dialog, it doesn't actually recurse a folder when it's searching, so that makes it a bit more like a filter instead. I was curious how the file manager handled different types of files, so like a Python file or a Ruby file or a shell script file, and it didn't seem to evaluate them at all at first. It seems that a file has to have at least one byte stored before the file browser will detect what type of file it is. I thought that it was the shebang at the top of the file, but turns out you can put anything in there and it will infer the type from the file extension, so that's cool. And while I was testing this, I figured I might as well try writing a script and seeing what happens if you just run it, and I made a typo which bricked the system. So uh, that's a good lesson why you don't want to just run random executable files because it will run anything that's inside of there, whether you want it to or not. Now LXQt is probably the desktop I'm least familiar with. Actually, I take that back. I don't know much about Enlightenment, so LXQt is probably the second least familiar desktop to me. It's known for its lightweight and really simple configuration and styling. Gecko Linux installed it with BTRFS and the overall install size is 4.2 gigabytes. That's pretty light. It sits here and idles a hair above or under 400 megabytes depending on which system monitor you're looking at. 
LX Tasks, which is the task manager, shows a bit less, but it does show that PC Man File Manager, which is the file manager written in Qt, is using the most resources, followed by the LX Panel. And HTOP reported 70 tasks and 138 threads. I stopped keeping track of those a while back, so I don't know if that's the lightest system we've had on the show, but it's definitely close. Now during the installer, I was wondering if ZRAM is enabled by default, and it is. It's enabled as a systemd unit, which is different than how I have my Debian set up. So Gecko Linux is based on the latest version, as of the creation of the install media, OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. Here we're using Linux kernel 5.12.4, it's using Bash 5.1.8, LXQ 0.17.0, the window manager is OpenBox, the window manager theme and theme in general is Numix, the icon set is Fayenza, which goes well with Numix, and yeah, that's the desktop. So being that I'm not very familiar with LXQ, the place that I go to learn about a desktop is the desktop settings manager. LXQ has its own control center, similar to Cinnamon's or XFCE's or even Windows's OG control panel. I noticed at the bottom that YAST configuration options are built in. We're not going to cover those because I've talked about them enough in OpenSUSE episodes, so. There's a run-of-the-mill appearance configurator here. You can pick the overall Qt style here, which is cool since pretty much all apps follow it by default. Now the default LXQ theme is Frost, but Gecko opts for an Ambience theme, which is, I think it's Ubuntu-like. The default font is Ubuntu, but there are tons of pre-installed and even silly fonts like Sony. Now OpenBox is themed separately. It's also super configurable in general, and it has a basic configuration syntax like in the config files and stuff. You can make this thing look and be like anything. When we first logged in here, I showed you that there was an OpenBox session selection from the login screen. So if you log into that, you get OpenBox, and that's it. I mean, you also get like this little app launcher thing if you right click, but I don't know if that's part of OpenBox or some separate extension. I could see how this session would be useful if you had an app auto start when you logged in. So if you wanted uh, like a single use machine, maybe like a media center or like a game console or something, you could have it just launch Steam as soon as you logged into the system. And that way that is the only thing that's running. Apps will continue to follow whatever theme was set in the regular LXQ session. So you could make it look how you wanted and then cut over to the open box session. There's probably built-in hotkeys that let you do all sorts of cool things like tiling, but I don't know what they are because I don't know open box very well. It has a very basic notification configurator with one of the ugliest notification appearance themes like I've ever seen. It has a settings configurator with its own daemons, which is just like KDE. I'm not sure if any other desktop does that actually. And it has tons of screensavers. Yes, screensavers. Linux usually calls them screen lockers or they're configured through a screen locker, but I mean, it doesn't have to be black. Why not have a screensaver on there? And back when screensavers were all the rage, like in the 90s and 2000s, there's tons of screensavers available and they all work here. A lot of them have tons of configurations, so I didn't dive too deep. I'd love to dive deeper in the future, but let's go back to regular Gecko Linux and see how well it does with the media tests. Now you would use Gecko Linux if you wanted OpenSUSE, but totally ready to go out of the box. OpenSUSE, like the vanilla OpenSUSE, is great for servers and workstations and stuff like that, but installing codecs and drivers and things can be a bit of a hassle. Gecko would also be fine for anyone looking for just a daily driver without needing to install a bunch of additional stuff. It opened all of the archive tests just fine, no additional packages needed, not even for RAR. It also opened all of the audio files without issues, and the metadata came through via the media player, so that's great. And it handled all of the video files pretty well too, but it stuttered a little bit with the FFV1 file. Honestly, this is really impressive. Most distros can't play every single file, and if they can, there's usually major troubles with a couple. Gecko Linux is basically flawless here, right out of the box. Now there's no SnapD or Flatpak installed by default, but after I installed Flatpak, I was able to launch and run Flatpak ref files, though the file manager didn't recognize a Flatpak ref file, so I had to do all that from the terminal. Linux binaries also seem to work just fine from the file browser, like I just launched the itch.io installer, and app images worked well after trusting them and marking them as executable, those are two different things. But that's pretty standard in most distros, minus the trusted executable thing. Now this is probably a good place to wrap this video up. 
Oh yeah, I'm forgetting something. Huh. That. So this is the thing that happens when you update Gecko Linux with the latest ISO from the website. So basically, Grub was installed and wasn't replaced with anything. My desktop and everything is just gone. Well, I mean, my data is there, but Grub is gone, so there's no way that I can get back into my system like the actual desktop. If this happens, you're basically screwed. You could reinstall Grub, but it's a nightmare, even for experienced Linux users. You are really better off just saving your data and reinstalling. The TLDR of it is that it is a packaging issue. Tumbleweed wants to upgrade something, and that something has a dependency on something that requires Grub to be uninstalled and or replaced with a new version of something else entirely, and something went wrong. Tumbleweed is designed to be fully upgraded regularly, daily if possible. If the image is too far behind, things like this might happen. Now that doesn't mean that the distribution is bad, it just means that the install image is too old. This most certainly would not happen during a regular upgrade if you were using the distro daily. So this is a good place to ask, how does EG like Gecko Linux? Now I looked at it before and I remember being generally unimpressed by it. Now LXQ is a weird desktop and a peculiar choice to request for the review. If this is how Gecko Linux is for all of the rolling flavors, I'm incredibly impressed. Some of the defaults are weird. The overall theme is an odd choice. It's not bad, but it's definitely a particular user's preference. It's surprisingly lightweight for its install payload. The media support is second to none. OpenSUSE Tumbleweed brings with it a lot of really cool innovations and tweaks. And as you guys know, I feel like OpenSUSE is an underrated powerhouse in Linux distros. Now that being said, I don't know if I would recommend this to a brand new Linux user. Maybe to a moderately experienced Linux user, Maybe someone wanting to tweak their desktop to suit them, but not wanting to find each and every codec and driver package. So somewhere in between an experienced user and a power user. Out of the Gex games I played for this video, Gex on N64 was my favorite and I played it the longest. I found Gex 1 to be really awkward and the controls made platforming just not fun. I have no nostalgia for this game. The art style is all right, but the animations just kind of make it painful to look at and play. Eh. Gex 3 is generally better, but I had no idea what I was doing because it was a demo. The graphics are still kind of ass. The controls are decent and the cutscenes are cute in that PlayStation 1 sort of way. The N64 Gex was basically Gex 3 on PlayStation, but with better controls and, in my opinion, worse graphics. The N64 graphics just don't really do it for me. Now I'm playing this on keyboard, so I can't control the camera, makes the controls feel a little bit stiff, but despite that, they feel really good. There's a part of the game where Gex suits up as a rabbit. Maybe he does that in Gex 3 as well. The overall gameplay is fun and forgiving. Gex himself is voiced by comedian Dana Gould. The voice work is good, but the jokes, they're not funny. Hey, I feel like I'm trapped in Boy George's pants. And then of course, there's Spyro. What's there not to love about Spyro? I want to thank everybody that watched this video all the way to the end, and a special thanks to Malternative who requested this review. It took me a few weeks to produce this episode, in large part because it's a new format, if you couldn't tell. It was a really fun episode to write and produce, and I hope that you guys liked watching it as much as I like making it. If you want to support me, I've got a Patreon and a coffee where you can donate to me. I'm always happy to see you following me on Twitter, and I appreciate all your support, and thanks for watching.